Welcome to More Than a Broker, the podcast that goes beyond the traditional definition of a logistics provider. My name is Andrew Elsner, co-founder of Spot. In each episode, we will dive into the stories of industry experts, keep you up to date on the highs and lows of the logistics marketplace, and introduce you to the people behind the advanced technologies that are driving innovation for brokers, shippers, and carriers within our industry. Join us as we explore the world of logistics through a different lens. This is More Than a Broker. Drivers, start your engine! I am really excited about today's guest, Matt Nettleton. Since 2003, Matt has coached more than 175 companies in a wide variety of industries. He has helped clients close more than $2.3 billion in new sales. We will talk about that success, how he got his start selling vacuum cleaners, and more. Let's dive into our discussion with Matt right now. I am really excited to have you here today because our industry has a component of it that's basically it's commoditized. There's 400,000 motor carriers. There's 16,000 brokers that do what we do. And our salespeople, it's very competitive. So everybody's out calling. And so as we made this podcast, I wanted to do it in this logistics industry. So I actually met you through your podcast yep. and had me on, which I appreciate. So I'm really excited to have you here today and, and just to talk a little bit of sales. And there's this industry, like I said, is very hyper phone sales. And the only thing I would tell you is that I can guarantee that your industry is not commoditized. Your industry is competitive. That's different. That's interesting. We hear it a lot. It's, it's commoditized. And, and when we built this thing, it was on how do you differentiate? So I thought you'd be a good person to talk to today about that. But I heard a funny story and I, wanna, I wanted you to tell it yourself, how you got in to sales uh, with your thumbs and, and, and then making it through to Coke. I, I loved it and I, I thought it'd be cool for people to hear that story because it's no sales story is the same and this one's pretty good. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I went out to play football in college. I ruptured all the ligaments and tendons in both my thumbs. My background, I'm not from a, a family where you can just sit at home and parents give you money. So my background was, you know, I had my thumb operated on. The doc says, hey, you can't lift anything over 25 pounds for the next nine months. My dad said, oh, that's cute. Um, you need to find a job because I'm not giving you any money for next year's school. And I'm like, oh, excellent. So uh, I saw an ad in the newspaper and the ad said, uh, limited effort, great money. And that was speaking my love language, right? right? <laughs> so I show up. It's open. Inter I call open interview Thursday morning, 8 a.m. I walk in. There's 42 people in the room and we're just standing there walking in circles, doing whatever people that don't know what they're doing do. And this guy walks up to the middle of the room, steps up. There's a little raised platform. He holds up his coffee cup. He goes, my name's Jim McVeigh. Uh, we sell Kirby vacuum cleaners door to door here. Uh, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. If anybody's here when I get back, happy to talk to you. And 40 of the people left. Left. Yeah. <laughs> Two of us were standing there, a guy named Paul Muma and myself. I'm like, why are you staying? He goes, well, my parents told me how to get a job. They didn't tell me how to make money. And he goes, why are you staying? I said, well, I, I've loaded trucks for the last six years. I, I can't lift anything. So, I mean, I got to make money. This has got to work. So, I went out, learned the sales pitch for a Kirby vacuum cleaner, knocked on doors, got into my first sales pitch. And if you've ever seen a Kirby vacuum get demonstrated, oh, yeah. there's a little attachment, yeah, yeah. little white disc. And so, I run the vacuum cleaner. I put the disc down, run the vacuum cleaner. I get four discs down. And uh, I made a discovery. I have uh, asthma. I'm allergic to cat hair and dust. And so in the middle of this first presentation, I'm 15 minutes into this, uh, I have a full-blown asthma attack, sweating, can't catch my breath, bent over, gasping. And the husband and wife say, uh, hey, could you step outside and pull yourself together? I'm like, ma'am, this has never happened before. And she's like, oh, well, that's okay. So I stepped outside, you know, it took five minutes, pull myself together. I come back in. They're like, we're not interested. I'm like what? They're like, we don't want the vacuum. 1500 bucks. You know, this is 1987. 1500 bucks is a lot for a vacuum cleaner. We're, we're not interested, but appreciate it. You don't even have to shampoo our carpet. No, you said you would when you got in. And I'm like, well, okay. So I took the vacuum cleaner apart, 
and I put it back in the box. Now I got these four white discs sitting on the floor covered in crap. And I look at them and they cost me money. So I just flip one over and start rubbing the dirt back in the carpet. And the, the wife freaks out. She said, what are you doing? I'm like, well, the discs, they cost me money. I'm making eight bucks an hour here. I need the disc for my next presentation. I, I mean, I'm just putting the dirt back where it was. She goes, well, we don't want the dirt. Uh, no, no. You, you said you don't want the vacuum cleaner. The dirt was here. The dirt's staying here. The vacuum wasn't here. The vacuum's leaving with me. I, but yeah, I don't understand. And so 15 minutes later, they wrote me a $1,500 check for a vacuum cleaner <laughs> that was already put away. <laughs> that was my first sale. That was like my first non-selling fundraising candy for a school sale. But that turned into 30 consecutive sales calls that summer where I would go into somebody's house and I would start the presentation and I would have an asthma attack. Every time. Every time. And the first couple of times it happened, it was a surprise. And by the end, it was kind of like, well, I can work Tuesday and I can work Friday. And then I might be able to work Tuesday again, but I'm going to need to recover between these. So you have a full blown attack. I have a full, you can't fake this. Can, can you feel it coming? Yeah, you can feel it coming. You, and it's like, bang. And so I learned, because I was selling with some guys that were hard, cheesy closers, terrible, terrible. I could never do that. And I never once said to somebody, would you like to buy a vacuum cleaner? In fact, I never sold a vacuum cleaner that I hadn't already taken the no on and put back in the box. And so my, it was always like, no, you, but you don't want, you don't want the vacuum cleaner. You told me you didn't want the vacuum cleaner. I'm just backing up and leaving. And they're like, no, we, we don't want the dirt. I'm like, okay, the dirt was here, $8 an hour. <laughs> How'd you get to Coke? I think I heard a funny story about that too. Did somebody bet on you not, yes, not so. making it? Coke came onto my college campus. They interviewed us. They, they flew a total of 275 of us to Atlanta, Georgia, put us up in a hotel for the day. Um, started, the day started with a math test that involved fractions, which, you know, after four years at college, I was like, really? But they interviewed 275 of us. It came down to, they hired three of us. My interview was with a guy who ended up being uh, my district manager, John Goodwin. And then his boss, John Cox, and, and John looked at me and said, your grades. I said, yeah, they're not too good. He said, well, we don't normally hire people with grades like yours. I said, ah, I, I get that. I'm just here for the drink voucher. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> what? I part. said, I've already got a job. I'm, I've, I've signed a lease. I'm living in New York City. I'm, I know what I'm doing. I, this was just the day trip. I, I, I got to see Atlanta. I've been to Atlanta before. I got to fly down, did some interviews. This is great. I appreciate it. He goes, well- Okay, well, we'll be in touch. And as it turns out, John Cox bet John Goodwin $5 that I would not succeed as a sales rep with Coke. And I ended up outselling the other three guys in my district combined because I thought about systems and processes and right. what can I do that will expand my reach. That's a tough sale when you're dealing with, with in the Coke network. Now, I was selling Coke in the cup, not Coke in the can. Yeah. Those are two different okay. companies. I happened to be stuck in Madison, Wisconsin, which at the time that I worked there had the lowest market share for Coca-Cola in the US because we had just gone through and there was some disagreement about whether bars were able to sell, would you like a rum and Coke when they were actually selling a rum and Pepsi? And so we had done some things that people didn't appreciate legally that I got to walk in and say, hey, you should buy soda from me. And they're like, you know what you did here, right? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> So, but we ended up, we, we did really well. I had some great partnerships with the local bottler um, up in Madison and in Rockford. And um, it, it ended up turning into a really solid relationship. So what percent of your sales career was over the phone, cold calling versus door to door, face to face? With Coke, a lot of it was you got to bump bellies. Okay. You got to go walk into restaurants and you got to talk to people. My first job with Coke, we were responsible for selling local accounts with one to five restaurants, which is most of America. But those local accounts with one to five restaurants, those are dudes that are, they're working the grill, they're working the register. They're all things. They're all things. Yeah. So when you walk in, you're interrupting their day. You better have some value. Probably, and I can't even remember the town that it was, but it was probably halfway between Quad Cities and Madison. 
I walked into a bar and I was wearing my navy blue suit with my tie, carrying my cheap briefcase, wearing my dress shoes. And I went to open my mouth and the bartender said, if you're from the IRS, I'm not here. Don't wow. start. And I'm like, what? He goes, nobody walks in here with a suit. So I'm assuming that you're not actually from the IRS, but drop the tie. <laughs> So I had to relate to that, which yeah. was a whole new thing because I had never, before I moved to Wisconsin, I had never been west of Ohio. So that like the whole area, I was just kind of floundering. Fast forward to today, you have a really cool sales training and coaching franchise here with Sandler. How is Sandler different? Sandler's different in a couple different ways. The biggest way is that we believe in reinforcement. There's a lot of sales training. When I was with Coca-Cola, we did Miller Hyman, we did Carew, we did Wilson, we did PSS, we did Xerox. We had a lot of those experiences and they would fly us to Atlanta and put us up in the double tree. And if you've ever stayed at Double Tree, you get chocolate chip cookies on the door. <laughs> okay. Best best thing ever, right? The, the secret. Yeah, that's the that's the best thing ever. And we would be there for two or three days and then we'd fly back to our territory and there'd be no follow-up. There'd be no now our managers were going through different training. So whatever we learned, our managers never said, Hey, did you do this? It was always what's your number? right? And then coaching was, did you hit your number and do I have to fire you? So that knowledge transfer doesn't really happen when it's one off. At Sandler, my typical client's with me four to six years. Um, I've got clients that I have trained since 2003 um, that, you know, we're on, you know, the son of one of their former people. His dad just retired from a company that I trained in 2021 that I'm still training the manager in 2023. We don't believe that you do it once and then you're done because, you know, people have a limited budget for sales training that doesn't work, but they have unlimited time and money to invest in training that produces a consistent result. So how does your typical interaction work? Are you working one-on-one with, with teams? Are you working individual coaching? So it'll be, you know, kind of threefold. So we'll have public training where we have multiple companies in a room and we'll train them there. Then we'll work with only managers from multiple companies. We'll work with only managers from a single company and we'll work with teams from a single company. And then on the back end, and probably the least utilized part of our process is one-on-one coaching. Because what really happens is if we can get people comfortable watching film as a group, right, which is my football life coming back to me, right? You want to watch film one-on-one? That's nice. (laughs) But you want to watch film in front of a team and then let everybody see right. what you did. That's where the real learning happens. And so whether they're using Gong as a conversational intelligence platform or any of the other call recordings or, or whatever, you know, role playing, getting people in a group and getting them reps and getting them comfortable with a consistent language and process to sell, it takes time. And it takes effort and it takes reps. And, and the funny thing is, you know, everybody starts, well, you don't understand. My business is different. Well, logistics, we're different than everyone else. And then you sit them next to the Mary Kay lady and the logistics guys start telling her how to do her business. And yes. she's like, well, my business is different too, you know, and, until there's that is a, true. a realization yeah. that it's like, oh, wait a minute. Humans are having conversations with humans about taking action that was different than before. You said something that's interesting for managers. Do you expect managers to do the same training as their reps? Because I I can see that the feeling of we're different. Yeah. Well, the managers are different. They have a a tremendously greater impact than the sales reps on sales revenue. Managers have four roles. So every manager that you have has to be able to recruit existing and new employees. They have to be able to train onboarding and ongoing. They have to be able to supervise and they have to be able to coach. Well, I can't do any of those if I don't have the language that my sales rep's using. Come back out on the floor, teach them something different. Yeah. So you send them, you know, you send somebody to me, I train them. I got great stuff. Your sales rep loves me. He learned something really cool. He comes back and, and he does it. And your manager goes, what was that? Never do that again. Here's how we do it. Now, the problem is that manager does it different than the other three managers that he sits in the cube with, right? So now you got four different versions being taught. And by the way, the sales rep that you paid me to train, 
he's not doing my stuff anymore because the guy that makes sure he keeps his job just told him to do something different. So managers have to be part of the process. Whoever owns the revenue has to be involved. So you look at the day you started, early 2000s? Early 2003, yeah. Okay. And then to today, how has sales changed? Because I hear this a lot. Like It's not the same as when you were doing it. It's not the same. It's different. What do you see as different? And then on the other side of that, what's the same? I'm going to even go back prior to 2003. So I'm my first car ride with my, my boss, John Goodwin, when I was with Coke, um, we sat down, we grabbed a cab from the Chicago O'Hare Airport. We rolled up to Schaumburg, picked up my company car, and then rolled up to Beloit, Wisconsin, and, and spent an afternoon in the Black Cat Lounge, wow. which is just across okay. the state line. <laughs> And he started my first sales meeting by getting out a two-inch thick binder and plopping it down on the table. With all the stuff. And it was, I said, what, what's that? And he goes, oh, that's your account listing. I said, what? He goes, that's the list of the 2,500 accounts you're responsible for figuring out whether or not they exist if we do business with them and what the serial numbers on all their fountain equipment is so that we can account for it. No, no cell phones, no computers. This was a two-inch thick, a like eight-point print, the L-shaped paper, and it was a train wreck. But if I made a phone call, there was no caller ID. There was no voicemail, yeah. right? I could walk in. And so I'd seen, I'm Harvard. I'd seen a Harvard study. I hate Harvard. But I had seen a Harvard study that in 1990, it took a little over like 2.1 calls Yes. To reach a contact. Well, the Sandler Research Center did a study last year, and it was 23.1 touches. To reach them. For to the reach first time. them. Never, the, never talked to them. Never talked to them. 23.1. 23.1. Here's, here's another stat from that. If you make a single call to a prospect, no other touches, just a single call to a prospect, you have a 0.36% chance of setting an appointment. Just a call. Just a call. So- People say, well, sales is a game of numbers, and it's not, right? Numbers are like dice. Like, sales is a game of intelligent design. You have to have a marketing team if you want to market at scale and create leads at scale that can create a cadence that salespeople can execute to have conversations that are relevant and meaningful and inspire action. But as much as your marketing team might be excellent, and my wife's in marketing, so I have to talk well about marketers. Your sales team has to, again, same language. They have to understand what the marketing team's doing, and the marketing team has to understand what the sales team's doing. And if there's no alignment there, well, those 23 touches, well, you're touching people, but it's just weird because they don't line up. Is there a way to beat the 23? I have that question all the time. How do you beat the 20? We tell them 15 here, so we're, we're off. But- the 23, how do you beat it? So there's, there's a bunch of ways. You know, you have to have a voicemail strategy. Uh, are you guys familiar with iOS 17? No. So iOS 17 is coming out in the next week. It has a feature called live voicemail. Oh, wow. And so live voicemail means if you remember the answering machine when we were growing yeah. up, you could start to listen to the message. And if you wanted to talk to the person, you just pick up the phone. Yeah. That's now a feature in iOS 17. Okay. Right? I like that. Well, yes and no. But the reality is now you have to even think more carefully about the voicemail that you're leaving. Does it have value? Would you answer it for yourself? So I've heard you say value in, the, in a voicemail. So some people say don't leave voicemails at all. And, and, and you're, hoping that they're, you're hoping they're going to use caller ID and see and you. call you back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, somebody that didn't leave a message called me. I should call them back immediately. I hear that a lot. Don't yeah. leave a voicemail. But you're, you say voicemail. I say leave a voicemail. Less is better. But if you don't leave a voicemail, you didn't call. That makes sense. Right now, going back to a long time ago, I used to have when I was with Coke, a five to $700 a month long distance bill for myself. And so I would get calls, hey, this is MCI. We can save you hundreds of dollars. Give us a call tonight. Like nobody returns those calls. That's not a valuable message, right? If you were to call up and say, hey, we've got freight and we've got great freight rates and we'll pay, you'll make more money hauling. That's not a valuable message. You can't win on that because 
you are sounding like everybody else that wants to talk to them. So there has to be a strategy behind the voicemails you leave, the questions you ask, the conversations you have. It can't just be, you're going to love it. If I'm listening to this and you say, create value in a voicemail, say, how in the heck do you create value in a voicemail? Mystery and allure. Mystery and allure. Do you have examples? First of all, there's all kinds of psychology on it, but it can't be, I've got a solution for your problem. It could be, I've helped other people like you, not sure if we're a fit. Don't know if I can help you, but I've helped other people. I've done a little research, not sure if it's accurate. I'm not going to call up somebody and say, I know exactly how to fix your problem, because then you're just an arrogant moron. You said a couple of times, we're not a commodity. Yes. And when somebody's in sales and they get told no, no one answers 23 point. Yeah. 23, you're a lot of calls. You're going to bang the phone. How does a salesperson change that? Change that mindset of we're not a commodity. Your clients, and, and we had a brief conversation about this, but 85% of your clients have 10 trucks or less. Yeah, or trucking companies, yeah. And so you look at those people and what you can do for them is life-changing. It's not a commodity. It's not just, oh, well, look, we get to hire somebody, you know, we get to move some boxes. No, if, if they can capture a steady stream of freight, that changes their world. And you have people on the other side that have boxes and stuff that need to be moved. Right. And if you can find them exceptionally reliable transportation, that changes their life. Your salespeople sit in the middle and they're either banging the phone with the hope that they don't get fired. Or they're hoping that they get somebody at either end of that transaction, and this could be their moment. This has the opportunity to change everything about your business. And it might not be this shipment, or it might not be this particular project. But if we can build a relationship here, I mean, there's a big spot at the top of the food chain. Yellow's gone. <laughs> they're gone forever. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question that, that I hear a lot in this industry. So I talk to a lot of different owners, travel across the country a lot. And the first thing they'll say is, where well, minimum is 100 this calls per day, minimum time this. What's your thoughts on metrics that are activity metrics for salespeople? Should they have them? Should we not? Are they Absolutely. You have, to, you have to do work, right? You can't, you can't hire somebody else to do sit-ups to get a flat stomach, right? <laughs> Tried. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> listen, <laughs> if it could be done, <laughs> yeah. right? But that's not the be all or end all. That's table stakes. When you get somebody onboarded, like that first 90 days, yeah, guess what? You're going to grind. You got to do 90 dials. You got to do 100 dials a day. I need you, if you get somebody on the phone to convert X number to a conversation, I need this much talk time. I, these are all metrics. These are all relevant. But there's also a kind of choose your own adventure. Where as you become more successful and you start to grow a book of business and you start to develop relationships, well, if you're in year six and you got to make 120 dials a day to have a conversation, something didn't work. We're missing something else. Right. <laughs> so there's a balance. I've got to have activity, but I've also got to be able to say as you grow in expertise, you should be able to do other things to grow your business. And there are other activities that you should be able to put on your bingo card that'll produce a result. When you think about today, so there's, you said earlier, the phone's changed. Email, I think, is okay. Text is becoming well, part of- When you say okay, what does okay well, mean? I don't love cold, cold emails for some reason. Well, because they don't them. work. Yeah, they don't work. And I don't believe in like sending out every day at 3 a.m. or 7 a.m. a thousand emails to people saying, hey, call me or I'll call you. But more targeted, specific emails that are not as, they're cold, but they're not. That are relevant and relevant, have value. Yeah. <laughs> to them. You know, yeah. The, yeah. And versus saying, hey, call us, we're spot here. Yeah. We, oh, great, great rates. You're going to love, love it. Us. Yeah. Call us now today. Yeah. And text messaging. You've got LinkedIn. So you've got all these different areas or ways to contact them. Are there any modes or methods of contacting somebody that you say, don't do it, it doesn't work? And then on the other side of that, is it, use all? So you should have a cadence set up. So a cadence is a series of events over a period of time that you use to reach a prospect. Now, a cadence is going to have a whole bunch of things in it. It might have text messages, might have email, might have phone calls. It should have phone calls. The phone call should have different scripted voicemails. Like if I called you three times and I knew you, 
But all three times, I just left the same voicemail. Hey, call me. You would think I was a little weird. Yeah, right. Right? Like, listen, obviously, I haven't called you. I'm clearly busy. Give me some reason. Right. Right? So, I, I, I should have different vo- – but, like, direct mail, the old postage, like, stamp, mailman, that still works and it has huge return on investment if it's targeted right. Right? There's – I've got a client that does the 12 days of Christmas and he has his employees go out and drop off 12 items, pens, notepads, small local drop local, them off the door. Drop them off because every year he does that, he sees a jump in sales from new clients. So you've got to think about in your world, in order to get in touch with the people that spend the money that you want to get your hands on, what are all the ways that you can get in touch with them? And what's a sequence that would make it more likely? And then you've got 100 salespeople out here. I I got bad news for you. They're not all going to be good at the same thing. And that's where we talk about choose your own adventure. So you might have one guy that makes 50 calls and sends 25 emails and shoots 15 text messages out. But he's got this buddy that's a mechanic at a trucking facility that he goes out and sees twice a week. And all of a sudden, bingo. When you think of cadence, so I walked out the other day and there was a rep that called me and said, hey, I I think the person blocked me. And I said, you think the person blocked you? What happened? And so we called two, three, four times in a row. All all in one hour? All in one day, yeah. All in one day. And I I said, well, well, (laughs) that's not the way to do this. But so I didn't know if you had a a thought on cadence from, from contacting on phone and voicemail, mail, email that you like or think is there rules that you follow. So- the cadence that you use to reach prospects should be related to the buy cycle of your prospects. So if, you're, if your prospects buy once every six years, you probably don't want to call them once a week. If your prospects are buying four or five days a week, it might be okay to send out a market update every morning at 7 a.m. Hey, here's, here's what we're seeing for fuel prices in these seven states. Here's what we're seeing for whatever in these four states. Here's a legislative update. You know, here's something you might want to know about a recall. You start to to provide value. When I was with Coke, one of the first things that, you know, after I got the two-inch thick binder was my boss whipped out two magazines. One was Beverage World and one was Beverage Digest. And I'm like, wow, what are those? And he's like, well, you're going to be getting these. And these come out weekly and you need to read them. Well, sounds fascinating. I'm sure I'll get to it. And he said, no. I'll be quizzing you. And I said, well, why? He said, because you need to understand what the people you're talking to are thinking about. You have to have business acumen. So when you talk to somebody, it can't just be buy from me. I I sell Coke in a cup. You should buy more Coke and bigger cups. Hey, listen, here's how this fits into a restaurant. Here's a cup set that will increase your profits by driving combo sales. Here are the reasons that you might want to do this differently. Your reps, they have to be able to do the same thing. Now, they can get the message across by text, by voicemail, by email, by direct mail. They can do it in social posts. They can do it. I mean, I'm assuming that they have cameras on their computers. They could do, they do video, video emails. Yeah, yeah. co-videos. Right? Or, yeah, yeah, co-video or uh, Vidyard or whoever yeah. you use. But we have all these tools and then – we don't provide value because we just send it to somebody and say, you should call us. I'm here. We got great rates. I had a pipelines. What do you feel like is, pipelines are important probably. I'm assuming you believe that. Is there too much in a pipeline that somebody can have versus too little? So a majority of pipelines aren't full, they're clogged. That's a fact. Yeah. So pipelines should have clear, mutually understood statements with timelines and next steps agreed to by prospect and salesperson, or they should not be in the pipeline, and they should be time limited. You know, we believe in what we call a clear future. We typically define that as something that happens within 72 hours. Now, there are people that will say, oh, my business, our buy cycle is. So, we can stretch that, but pipeline, the time that somebody should be able to stay in a stage is shorter than you think it is. Because the only person at that point that's thinking about it is the salesperson and the manager wondering what's going why on. Is this, yeah, why is this happening? So when would you look at a clog and say, hey, this clog's got to be cleared? How long should that prospect stay there before it's how, gone? How frequently do people buy from you? 
But what if you said they're not worth it? Is there a point where you say, hey? So as a manager, if I'm doing a pipeline review, my default position is everything on here is fake. We're taking it all away. So as a salesperson, your job is to give me compelling reasons. And we talk about, you got to be able to find meatloaf. You're familiar with meatloaf? Meatloaf? America's yeah. greatest singer-songwriter? Yeah. I don't know about greatest, but good. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if somebody is in my pipeline, they have to have a minimum of two of the three primary elements, which are pain, budget, and decision. You either have to have a problem that's significant and emotional to you. You have to have proven that you have a value you place on it being solved. Or you have to convince me that you have made a decision about this in the past and are planning on making one in the near future. And if you don't have two of those three, I don't know why you're in my pipeline. There's a lot of people that get into sales. To me, it's the most rewarding career that you could ever do. I love it. To getting to meet people, be around people, help people. So that, that to me is like what drives me in this. A lot of people get into it and about six months in, they look around and say, ah, this isn't for me. What do you think that is? Why do you think people fail? Day one, they're excited. Day 180, it's like, ugh. Go back to the manager piece. I think a lot of the reasons that people fail, it comes in the recruiting. So we believe that as a manager, your responsibility is to come up with a clear job description and an interview rubric and what we call a search model where you have defined what an ideal candidate is and you can put that target up on the wall. And when you throw an interviewee at it, you can tell whether or not there's a bullseye. Okay. And what we see most of the time is we'll talk to managers and say, hey, how'd the interview go? And they'll look at us and say, well, he said this and this and this. Looks like a bullseye to me. Well, they, they threw the guy up on the wall and then went up and painted the bullseye around him. <laughs> right? I mean, it, that's not how bullseyes work. Right. <laughs> right? So, so we think that you can do, so Tech Point's a client of mine. Okay. We, we run a thing called the Sales Boot Camp where we take people who are looking to get into tech sales from non-tech sales or looking to rejoin the workforce from, you know, whatever. And, and we put them in tech sales and, and we've done six boot camps, seven boot camps. We put about 150 people to work. We did the first few using a, a different assessment tool that I was not fond of. And we switched to the one that we use. When we used a correct sales assessment tool, the per person productivity jumped 60%. Because what we ended up with was people who were a little bit more wired to do the stuff that makes salespeople successful. You know, there's, there's no left-handed shortstops in the majors, right? Because it just doesn't work. You just can't run that way and throw right. that way. So, you know, there's no assessment that will ever say, hey, this person can't do sales. There's a lot of good validated assessments that will say, hey, this person could do it. It's going to be an absolute death march with cocktails. Right. It's and you can see it. Yeah. Constant hand holding. Do you really want this? That first step is did you evaluate the person appropriately? The second step is do you have a formalized onboarding plan that's relevant to the job with sequence knowledge? You got to have that, right? Because that first 90 days, you guys have a lot of fresh college students. They're great. They can play beer pong, right? <laughs> right? I mean, they can sleep it's a till new noon. Industry. No one grows up saying I'm a freight broker. Yeah. Doesn't happen. No. But but they don't learn anything of, of of relevance in college to doing a job. And if they were an accountant, you would train them to be an accountant. If they were, you know, a machinist, you would train them to be a machinist. And they're a salesperson. A lot of companies go, "Oh, you got good people skills. That's just the luck." <laughs> we hear it all the time, like. Are you meant for sales? Yeah, they're meant for sales. And to that point, people will say, I'm a people person, which means nothing. Because if you can't listen and you can't help people, it doesn't really work. Off the top of your head, what are a couple of things that companies should look for in people to be a sales? Is there career history or college athletics? Well, so, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. One, self-awareness. Salespeople have to be self-aware. So the hardest people to coach somebody that you see do something stupid and you say, hey, don't do that again. And they look at you all doughy eyed and say, oh, but I didn't do that. And you're like, Ugh. it's not going to work. <laughs> Which part of no self-awareness was... A so, you know, it's a measurable. And then there's initiative, you know, that internal drive to hit whatever standard it is you find appropriate. So we measure a thing called competitive style. 
on a scale of zero to nine. Competitive style. Competitive style. So zero is I just want everybody to win. Everybody gets a ribbon. I'm a nine. Nine is if we play, I not only want to beat you, I then want to burn your village and steal your livestock. <laughs> so none of the weaknesses, the opposite strength is not necessarily good because if I acted out on my natural competitive style, like I'd be a psychopath. Nobody would, no, 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 nobody would buy for yeah. anything from me because I'd be terrifying. Yeah. So what you're really trying to do is, and, and you've got the, the data here or the people here to develop the data, is you can see that there are ranges that are appropriate for certain scores. I always look for three. I look for self-awareness, initiative, and competitive style. Because I know if somebody is aware of what they're doing, if they like to take action, I'd rather say, you know, whoa, slow down than giddy up. Like successful salespeople, you don't have to say giddy up very often. And then if I can put a scoreboard up, I'm putting it up yeah. because the guy that I won, the woman that I want to work for me, they look at that scoreboard and they say, well, well, I'm number two, but I bet I could be number one. So I love, there's a statement, I forget who said it, that the quality of your life will be determined by the quality of questions that you ask. And I always listen to new salespeople and it's tough. It is very tough, but it's awesome to see them day one to where they get to when they, they go about six months into this, like much different. Do you have rules for questions? Do you allow scripts or do you say no way to scripts? We're going to give you guideposts. And then is there anything from a question standpoint that you follow that says, hey, this improves my questions, improves the conversations? So it's funny. In 2020, I did a talk at the Sandler Summit, which is our international user group, and it was about asking questions. Because questions, the idea of questioning, it's a skill. Listening is a discipline. Questioning is a skill. You can get better at asking questions. There are five primary types of questions. There are three specific areas that you can ask about any business. There are time frames that questions are more effective and less effective in. But the big thing with questions is if you don't have a natural professional curiosity, if you don't get rewarded for it, it, it can be hard. Now, you said something that I, I, I want to, you mentioned scripts dismissively. Some people like them, some people don't. I struggle with them. Let's start with this. Who said, I'll be back? Terminator. Okay. He turned that one line into an entire career. That wasn't in any script. That was them playing around at the end of a day of shooting. And they were like, what would happen if we dropped the robot into metal? What do you think he would say? And they filmed it and it turned into- Most famous line. Yeah. Most, most famous line. He became the governator. Yeah. Now he's whatever. Yeah. So- I think that every every good role starts with a script, but the script is not what the actor does. So that onboarding plan I mentioned, that 90 days, you better be learning your script. But at the end of that 90 days, you better be an actor and you better know what the script means and what the person that is successful in this role does. And how do you talk to somebody? Because you've got, you know, in, in any sales team, you've got 2% that are crushing. 98%. Well, I'm not going to write my, my sales script based on somebody who's in the 47th percentile. I'm writing my sales script on somebody who's in the 98th percentile. And I want my actor to be as close to that as possible. Arnold wasn't playing a mediocre robot that was here to clean floors. The other thing that I see a lot that's interesting is the very first line you get with a decision maker. The very opening statement seems to be where people just get stuck the most because I feel like it's following a script. Hey, this is Andrew Spot. And how are you doing? So I don't know if you had thoughts on that because that that's a challenge. I think a lot of people in this industry, there's a lot of companies that call and do the same intro and it sets off what I call a pattern that ruins the call downstream. We operate in fixed and rigid patterns. And, and one of the patterns that we operate on is salespeople say, how are you today? Which is a hate crime. How are you today, <laughs> right? I, mean, I hate that. I like that term. Right? So we, we believe that there should be a pattern interrupt. I mean, if I start a call, I always start with, hey, Matt Nettleton, Sandler training name probably doesn't ring a bell. The reality is they could say no or yes, but either way, I'm getting information. Right? And, and so we think that you should design your introduction. You should design every part of your conversation to create as much information gathering as possible. And how are you today? Doesn't gather any information. Doesn't work. No. <laughs> How's the weather? I had a question. 
how long do you stay at somebody? You got told no once. We ship, but we're not shipping with you. We ship, we're not shipping with you. When do you say, hey, it's too much. I've, I've gone too long with you. It's time to let somebody else try this. Before I pitched, did they commit to shipping with me? No. Well, that's most of your problem. So my, my wife has got a thing for Matt Damon. Okay. Right? <laughs> so every time a Matt Damon movie comes out, we go to see the Matt Damon movie. I get to pay for an expensive dinner. I get some popcorn. I get to pay for overpriced movie tickets. And then I go watch a crappy movie. Right? Well, if I went up to the kid who's making eight bucks an hour at the box office and I said, hey, listen, pal. Well, I just got a thing for Matt Damon. I'm not really excited about the movie. I'm going to go watch the movie. If I like it, I'll pay on the way out. What would the $8 an hour worker say? No Stare way. at you. Yeah. No way, you moron. Wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> before I do that kind of work and let you see the movie, you got to commit to a ticket. Well, if I'm pitching before somebody says, hey, I'll, I'm ready to ship with you, I'm showing him the movie without any commitment of a ticket. Like, And then- there's really nothing else for us to talk about other than, hey, let me pitch you again. Let me pitch you again. Let me pitch you again. Does he have a reason to switch? Is he perfectly happy with his current guy? I mean, is everything on time? Is everything delivered as, as promised? Is it unbroken? I mean, what are the criteria he uses to decide whether or not to stay with his current guy? And if one of those gets violated, can I help him? And if I can, I mean, that's where we're no longer a commodity. If I say to somebody, listen, if you've got a truck or if you've got freight, we can fix your problem. I'm a commodity. If I say, listen, we help a lot of people. We make X number of shipments per day. That does not mean I can help you. I don't know anything about you. I don't know what your goals are. I don't know what your metrics are. I don't know what your strategy for picking a shipper is. And when I figure those out, I'll tell you whether or not I can help you. And if I can help you, I'll tell you how. But until I know that, I'm not telling you anything because it doesn't matter. What advice would you give to people? You've been in sales really your whole life since an early age. And you've been highly successful. You've done multiple companies before starting your own and doing this. What advice would you give to somebody that says, I want to learn, where could they go learn sales? Podcasts, books. What do you think? Is there any good areas. I uh, did not want to learn and I sold vacuum cleaners door to door. The best way to learn how to sell is to go do it. Um, when we were setting up the Tech Point Sales Bootcamp, Mike Langelier, who was the CEO at that time, said, well, we'd like you to get them in a, in a classroom for 20 days, like nine to five, just give them some instruction on how to sell for 20 days. And I said, Mike, I'd sooner pluck my eyes out with a spork. <laughs> I said, yeah, why don't we do this? Let's give them two days and then put them in a company and get them on the phone. And then we'll bring them back for a half hour, for a half day. And then we'll put them in a different company. And then we'll bring them back. And then we'll put them in a different company. Once they've been in three or four companies, they'll know what selling is, right? Now, that's hard to replicate if you're just an individual. But here's the thing. I don't really care how old you are. If you want to get in sales, people are hiring salespeople all the time. Take a sales job hang a number. You'll get raises. You'll get promoted. You can pick your path at that point. How do you define closing? Confirming the sale. You should never have to say anything more than what happens next to close the sale. If you have to say anything more than that, you've screwed it up. I was um, listening to a podcast you were on. You talked about upfront contracts. How do you use upfront contracts in sales? If I'm a salesperson, how can I leverage an upfront contract? Let's talk about what an upfront contract is to find the term. The, the simplest description of an upfront contract is the rules of the game, right? If you're going to play Major League Baseball, how many innings? Nine, right? If you're going to play football, four quarters, right? If you're going to play Canadian football, you get to run forward before the ball snaps. Very confusing. But none of those rules apply if we're playing volleyball. So an upfront contract simply says if I start a conversation with somebody, I should be able to tell them before we get started, hey, here's what I'm trying to accomplish, right? So I get somebody on the phone that I've never talked to before. I get that 95% unlikelihood that they pick up and they pick up and they said, hey, this is Matt. And I said, well, Matt, this is a sales call. <laughs> I'm going to take 30 seconds of your time. You can tell me you don't want to talk. That's an upfront contract. If I say, hey, why don't we do this? I'm going to call back Tuesday at two. We're going to have a 15-minute conversation. I'm going to ask you about what your shipping goals are, 
how you measure success, and how you pick a shipper. If I think I can help you in any one of those three areas, I'll tell you. If I don't think I can help you, I'll tell you I can't help you. Are you okay with that plan? Yes. It's a pattern interrupt. It's a it different is, way of asking. It, it is disarmingly on it. That's disarming. Yeah. Right? They don't so, know what to say. Well, they, they don't know what to say because everybody else tries to fool them into thinking like, oh, this is just a marketing call. No, it's a sales call. They'll figure it out when you ask for money. <laughs> when you ask about the weather. Yeah. As soon as you say, how are you today? You said something that I really love, um, creating value in a call. And that's something that I feel like people in this industry, in all sales, they call. It's all about them. It's about them, their success, them getting the sale, them moving on. How does a rep create a mindset of creating value in phone calls? In your opinion, I mean, that's a tough thing because people are, one, they're calling scared maybe. Will I get the sale? Am I going to look good to my boss? Will I get a big commit? Whatever it is, instead of calling and creating value. You can't necessarily create it. You can help people discover it, right? Call has to have value. The only person that has the value is the person that's potentially buying. So you've got to let the person who has the value discover that there's value in the conversation. And the only way you can do that is by asking good, relevant, business acumen-centered questions. And so I use the phrase create value or it has to have value, but the reality is the value is can you ask questions that are relevant to the person that you're talking to? Can you give them third-party examples of typical problems that people have that you talk to? And then say, I'm not sure if you have that. If you have it, we could talk about it. If you don't have it, I got a couple others. And if you don't have any of them, I'll hang up. I think it's one of the biggest things that people call. It's all about them. It's, it's really creates the wrong tone, well, the wrong pattern. Typical, typical salesperson bonding is enough about me. What do you think about me? It's like schizophrenia. <laughs> yeah. It's back and forth. It's, yeah. Yeah, am I going to mess up? Are you, yeah. yeah. And, and the reality is, I'm really kind of inconsequential. Like, I just want to find out, if, listen, we, we got services. We help a lot of people. Not sure if you're somebody we can help. Want to have a conversation? If we can't, I'm going to move on. You're going to move on. You won't remember me in five minutes. How do people get a hold of you and, and learn more about you? Because I really enjoyed talking sales with you. I think I love what you say, creating value in, in the sales process. So how would people find out more about you? They can find me at Sandler DTBND on uh, social media. Uh, they can search uh, Sandler DTBND on LinkedIn, or they can search Matt Nettleton at LinkedIn is the end of it is get Matt. But that's the, you, if you search Matt Nettleton on YouTube, you're going to find me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, I, again, like I said, I really enjoy it. I think now in our industry more than ever, it's a hot button issue. The sales process, we've come out of a two year crazy uh, period in our industry, unheard of. And so now more people are on the phone than ever. And so how do you differentiate yourself and, and grow your business? I think this hopefully will resonate with people. Process and value. People will always hire unlimited budget if, right. you, if you give them value. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Spot's Market Update podcast segment. My name is Andy Kropp, and I'm the CFO and COO at Spot. Joining again this month as the moderator for what's hopefully another exciting market update segment. We've got one new guest this month, Brian Smith. Brian's our director of sales at Spot, has been with us since 2017, and dates back in the industry quite a, a ways. I say that nicely, of course. About 20 years plus, all the way back to the American backhaulers days. So welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on. And then returning guest, he, he got the invite back, Ryan Scott. Ryan's our director of carrier sales, been with Spot about four plus years now, prior history in the asset base side. From a day-to-day -day standpoint, Ryan leads the carrier sales team that is booking about 25 or 30,000 loads per month for Spot. So great perspective on the market. I always really value what Ryan has to say. So welcome again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. To get us kicked off, it's been about a month since our last podcast. And to me, it feels like the market has made a noticeable shift in that time period. From everything I'm seeing, the market seemed to finally find its bottom in the June, July timeframe after about 16 months of steady decline from the end of Q1 and back in 2022. Ryan, let's start with your market perspective. What have you seen in the last uh, month or so? It did feel like we hit the bottom. Uh, last time we talked, I know we touched on that. And uh, we started to see some signs of tightening in the market, but it does feel like in the last few weeks, uh, we've sort of slid back a bit. Just kind of feels like we're still 
in that bouncing around the bottom period, kind of getting a feel for for where things are headed here into the peak season. Yeah, I think you're right. It seemed like there was some activity around Labor Day that maybe melted, made it feel like we were bouncing back up. But now a few weeks post Labor Day, I agree, maybe still kind of settling towards the bottom a little bit. Yeah. You know, we saw spot rates spike a little bit and then they look like they're up right now a little bit slightly, but you also have to keep in mind diesel prices are up significantly. I know we'll probably get more into that later, but when you take that component out, you're really sitting there more neutral, maybe even down slightly over the last couple of weeks sequentially. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes sense. And maybe we'll hit on fuel in just a second, but Brian, from your side on the, the customer perspective or the shipper perspective, What are you seeing demand-wise? Are we still seeing volumes holding steady? Are we seeing slippage? What does that look like? When we look at the overall volume level from year over year, we're down about 6% year over year from this time last year. As you mentioned, I do believe we hit bottom in June and July. We did see that uptick in August and September. So as we look forward into Q4, I think that the market will continue to have a slight uptick due to seasonality activities, but I don't think it's going to be a Q4 that we normally see. That's consistent with what I'm seeing. I think one area is inventories, right? We've, we've really been watching that closely throughout the cycle here. A lot of over inventory levels earlier this year. It seems like that's stabilized a little bit. We track the port activity. You know, port volumes are not anything super exciting. Do you think that Q4 is, is going to be more muted from a peak market perspective? Yeah, I do not think that Q4 is going to have the market volatility that we've seen. Um, You mentioned inventory. Shippers have been right-sizing their inventory over the past year. Restocking will occur during certain peak periods. However, I think shippers are going to be hesitant in their demand forecasting to avoid overstocking warehouses and getting back into the same spot that they were. Maybe let's pick back up that fuel point that, Ryan, you mentioned a moment ago. According to What I've seen and and been tracking, I think this was our ninth straight week of diesel cost increases going back to mid-July. The OPEC countries are not, you know, indicating that there's going to be a surge in supply anytime soon and demand is likely to kind of hold steady. So I think we'll be in this range of elevated diesel prices for a while. What, What are you hearing from the carriers in the network? Fuel prices are a huge cost component for carriers. So um, when you see, you know, an increase of over 20% in diesel prices over the last, you know, nine weeks or so, it's it's significant. And so, I think last time we we spoke, we talked a little bit about the, you know, the disparity and some of the differences between the carriers who are more uh, invested in the contract market, who have a lot of their pricing structured with the line haul plus a variable fuel surcharge. A lot of that can be recouped. But there's a big segment of the the carrier base that that operates more in the all in spot market pricing, and and those carriers are really going to find it difficult to recoup those costs as quickly as they're rising. So now on on the flip side, when when fuel prices decline, that's advantageous for them, obviously. But that's not the story that we're we're you know that's not what's happening right now. So I think that pressure is going to continue to mount. You talk about that, but also there's insurance costs are going up. There's a lot of cost pressures, but hearing a lot of stories from the floor, so to speak, and anecdotal feedback from carrier reps talking to their carriers, it is tough. But the thing I hear a lot is it's tough, but we're getting through it. But yeah, this this diesel spike is, is certainly squeezing people pretty tight. I'd like to jump in on that as well, kind of on the, the customer side. You know, I've seen, I've read that the price per barrel could go from $88 to $120, which is going to vastly increase fuel surcharges. Yep. So we don't really know how quickly that's going to happen or when it's going to happen, but that will drastically affect the customer's overall spend. Yeah. And, well, it's, and, it's budget season, yeah, the right? Budget, so yeah, so budget any, any, any customer that's hitting that you know, 2024 budget right now, there's a total transportation spend that comes into play. But fuel is a huge component of that. And so to Ryan's point, fuel is going to impact transportation cost more broadly in terms of what carriers have to cover. But then the fuel surcharge component that shippers uh, end up covering is, you know, could be pretty sizable. A couple other questions maybe to just go through here. Ryan, seems like I got a few more for you this month, but we've been talking a bit about the automotive shutdown. You know, it'll be interesting to see 
how quickly that gets resolved. But if that were to scale up and we're talking about widespread strikes, what is your anticipation on the capacity side? There's a ton of capacity in the automotive space. I don't think we've seen anything immediate dramatically affect that, but something to keep an eye on for sure. In my past life on the asset side, working heavily with automotive customer base, you know, I can speak from experience that even the planned shutdowns that a lot of these automotive companies, manufacturers do can have a pretty dramatic impact on a, on a fleet who's tied in very heavily with those, those customers, those shippers. So there's a lot of downtime, unplanned downtime for these trucks and these fleets that are now trying to keep their wheels turning and keep revenue on those assets. So where do they go? They, they're, they're searching on the spot market and there's just not a lot there. So I think it's something to keep an, uh, keep an eye on for sure um, if it continues to, to last. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Have we seen a change in, in capacity in the last month or so since our last podcast? I know we talked about the potential that you know, trucks continue to come off of the market as, as new entrants are struggling to make it. Can you give us an update ar- around that? I think we are still waiting for that, call it the, the, big, to the big wave. Yeah, right. And, and I don't think we've seen it. So I don't know the timing of that, when it's going to happen exactly or if it will happen. But I think we're just now starting to see some of the labor statistics point to fleets not increasing headcount. So I think there's there's been a lot of talk around exiting ca- capacity exiting the market. I think there's a, a different take where there's a lot of capacity shifting to different segments of the market. So a lot of these smaller fleets, owner operators, we are seeing those revocations, authorities being revoked. However, we're also seeing uh, we're also seeing employment stats indicate that overall trucking employment isn't really declining like we would have expected. So I think there may be a shift going on to larger fleets where capacity from these smaller companies and owner operators are are finding employment at larger fleets as well as I was reading an article the other day. You know, there's been some press around the Dollar General private fleet seeing some significant growth and them reporting on that. But also there were a number of other very large private fleets that had reported plans or or actual growth here in the last year. So something to keep an eye on there as well. One more question for Brian, and then I reserve the right to ask you for a forecast for the rest of the year. So Ryan, you think about that and I'll ask Brian this question. I read a quote the other day related to the market. It said, the best part of the market is when the pendulum finally starts shifting to the middle. That's when the relationship becomes collaborative, not transactional and combative. Do you have a sense, are shippers thinking that way or is this kind of a one-off quote? Are, are we seeing a, a mind shift to let's really collaborate and work together instead of a race to the, the lowest cost? That's a great quote and I agree to it to a certain extent. And what I mean by that is, you know, when we talk about collaboration, we focus on two things. It's relationships and trust. I feel that especially with our larger contractual shippers, we definitely see that mentality. Both parties understand there's going to be ebbs and flows within the market. And at the end of the day, relationships and trust are key pillars to a partnership. And I've seen that with many customers. Let's wrap up with quick forecasts for the rest of the year. Ryan, keep it short, but what are you thinking? I'm not calling for a strong peak season this year. It wouldn't take much for it to be stronger than last year, but I don't see anything fundamentally pointing to a large shift in consumer demand this holiday season. So no bold predictions there for me. Okay. Steady state somewhat, maybe some ups and downs. Brian, anything different on your side? Yeah. I mean, I think overall, it's probably going to remain pretty stabilized. Um, I do think it's maybe dependent on customer vertical. Mm -hmm. Um, You're probably going to see some shifts in Maybe in the food and beverage, just due to the, the holiday, holiday season. season, yeah, sure. Um, possibly even in the packaging sector, due to spikes in e-commerce for holiday ordering, things of that nature. But overall, I feel like it's going to be pretty, pretty stable. I agree. Yeah, I like it. Thank you, gentlemen. Hopefully, everyone finds this month's update useful, and we'll talk again soon. And that's a wrap for more than a broker. You heard firsthand accounts from industry experts and Spot's hardworking individuals revealing a culture of collaboration and innovation. For more information about Spot, our service offerings, our people, and culture, 
our job postings, and more, check us out online at spotinc.com. That is spotinc.com. Thank you for listening and for being part of this journey. Until next time, keep striving to be more than a broker.